Hi folks and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast, Season 18, Episode 6. And by the way, this is the 400th Wednesday show. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Yes, indeed. Welcome to episode 400 of Meaningful Money. That's a lot of work, right? <laughs> Lots more to come. I'll make much more of a song and dance uh, about episode 500, which I reckon will probably be sometime in late 22, I reckon. It doesn't feel that long since we uh, celebrated in a fairly low-key lockdown kind of way 10 years of the show. So 400, nice milestone. It's just a number, though. Not anywhere near done yet. I hope you're glad to hear. But look, over the last couple of weeks, we've covered the ultimate guide to investing. I think we need to just sort of finish that off and talk about some of the important mechanisms of investing, the accounts that we use, pensions, ISAs, all that sort of stuff. So that's where we're going today. After the main body of the show, I'll read a review out that's been left, announce what we're going to be talking about next time. But of course, as always, before any of that, for nearly 10 years now, this podcast has been brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They've been helping me out for that long, which is just incredible, and I'm really grateful to them for doing so. So please do check out what they're up to. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. Definitely go check them out. Now, I've been a financial advisor for more than 20 years. One thing I've noticed is that people often get confused about the building blocks that we use to put together a cohesive portfolio. So last week, we talked a little bit about the main accounts that you need, pensions and ISAs. I want to build on that today just to add a little bit of detail around the side. So that's where we're going. Uh, remember, notes, links, all at the show notes, which is the only link you need to remember. Meanfulmoney.tv slash UG6. There's a workbook there which kind of encompasses the uh, last couple of weeks, uh, and it'll help you with everything that we're talking about today as well. It's free really help you understand and then apply all this stuff in practical ways. Stay tuned also for more details on a special offer on the Build Wealth phase of Meaningful Academy, which takes this subject even deeper. Lots more besides as well on there. And and if you're watching this on YouTube, you can use the chapter markers to skip to the relevant points. And you can also do that on the audio player on the show notes page. If you're ready, then buckle up because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Let's look at everything you need to know first. Okay, well, most people only need a pension and an ISA. And I said in the introduction last week that I wanted the ultimate guide to be for the masses, not for the few. I tend to find that I get most questions from the extremes of people. So either those who are just getting started and really don't know anything, or those that have really niche needs, maybe because they're high earners or they've got trust funds or, or whatever. So I spend inevitably my working days working mostly for the latter, the, the wealthier people who have maybe more technical things they need to work out. But of course, the vast majority of people, by definition, fall in the middle of the bell curve, you know, the normalist of normal people. And those people mostly just need a pension and an ISA. Now, given that last week was mostly about what you need to do as an investor, I kind of sketched over the main types of ISA. So let's just dig a little bit deeper into that. And there are four types primarily. Firstly, you've got cash ISAs. These are just tax-free bank accounts. So you pay absolutely no tax at all on the absolutely no interest that you're getting. Okay. <laughs> so think about this. The first £1,000 of interest received on any money that you've got in a bank or bill and society is tax-free anyway. So if you're lucky enough to have an account paying you 1% in interest, then that means you have to have more than 100 grand in the bank to get in anywhere near paying tax on your interest anyway. Remember point one from last week, don't hold too much cash. So cash ISAs for that reason alone are basically not worth considering. So moving on. Lifetime ISAs. These are special kind of ISA with a £4,000 annual contribution limit. Whatever you put in, the government makes up by 25%. So if you put in the, four, the full £4,000, uh, that nice man Rishi Sunak will make it up to £5,000. That's obviously a super useful benefit. We do like free money here on Meaningful Money, but the quid pro quo, as they say in Bradford, is that you can only use that money for two purposes, buying your first house 
or for using after the age of 60, essentially, for retirement or later life. If you take your money out, which you can, you can do it, but if you take your money out for any other purpose than those two things, you will have to pay a penalty of 25% of whatever you take out. That's the normal penalty. It's been temporarily reduced to 20% until April next year. Maybe it'll get extended, we'll see, but it's just to account for the fact that many people will have needed access to their lifetime ISAs during the COVID crisis. Lifetime ISAs can be held uh, in cash or stocks and shares. I should just mention help to buy ISAs. You can't get them anymore. That's why I've not mentioned them here. They were kind of a precursor to the lifetime ISA. You may have one already. Lifetime ISAs are really where it's at now if you're looking to buy a house. So speaking of lifetime ISAs being able to be held in either cash or stocks and shares, let's talk about stocks and shares ISAs. Now we're talking. These really are the bread and butter ISAs which are loved by wealth builders everywhere. So in a stocks and shares ISA, you can invest in funds, directly held shares, ETFs, all kinds of cool things. You pay no income tax on dividends, no capital tax, uh, capital gains tax rather on any money that you make, any gains that you make as it grows. Generally, they're super flexible, completely accessible without penalty usually. Watch out for dealing fees, depending on what it is that you're holding inside your ISA. But stocks and shares are pretty cool. And then finally, we have innovative finance ISAs. And these are a special ISA wrapper set up to hold peer-to-peer -peer lending investments. I'm not a huge fan of P2P, unless it's for a tiny amount of money relative to the whole. In recent times, I think its weaknesses have been shown as there's been a huge increase in defaults by borrowers. And that means that some people are currently having a hell of a job getting their money out of a peer-to-peer -peer lending scheme. Not a problem if you can afford to wait your turn but a huge issue if you've bet the whole farm on P2P and you need your money now. Now, most of us will need to use ISAs to some degree. You should largely discount cash ISAs because they're not a lot of use and innovative finance ISAs because they're pretty niche. But the stocks and shares ISA and the lifetime ISA, sorry, I just can't bring myself to call it a Lisa or a Lisa. That's where most of us need to concentrate our efforts, more on which later, okay? Then, of course, we've got pensions. Now, as I mentioned last time, pensions fall largely into occupational and personal camps. So occupational schemes, those made available to you at work, they are either defined benefit, where you get a guarantee of a future income based on your salary and the length of your membership of the scheme, or they are defined contribution, DC, where you and your employer pay into a fund, and what you end up with at the end depends on how much goes into the fund and how well it grows. That's occupational schemes. Personal schemes are always defined at contribution. There is always a fund involved. And it's all about maximizing the level of that fund over time so that it's a useful amount when you've had enough of working for a living. Pensions can't be accessed before age 55, and that is actually rising after 2028 to be the state pension age minus 10 years. So remember all that as we go through this, but basically for the vast majority of the population, those two accounts, a pension, of some kind and an ISA of some kind are all you need. Just one more thing to mention, a SIP is a self-invested personal pension, SIPP. These days SIPs are commonplace. Uh, the term is really used to denote a pension that is not an insured pension offered by an insurance company. SIPs generally offer access to more different kinds of assets such as individual shares, ETFs, commercial property, and a lot more besides insured pensions, generally just insurance kind of funds, really. All right, so I tend to prefer just calling them a pension, whereas a lot of people call every kind of pension a SIP. You know, a SIP really is a subset of a pension, so I prefer to use that term. Okay, second thing you need to know. That's quite a long start, wasn't it? <laughs> Our first point, we're nearly nine minutes in. Okay, um, point number two, wrapper choice is primarily about tax and access. So the combination of a pension and an ISA really gives you the best of all worlds when it comes to the two main drivers of wrapper choice. By the way, wrapper is just the term I use to mean the different kinds of account. So pensions and ISAs are wrappers. So are EISs and VCTs that we'll cover shortly. So are onshore bonds, offshore bonds, general investment accounts. These are accounts really, wrappers. Got that? Okay, good. Right, so if you have both a pension and an ISA, you can determine where to put the money that you're saving towards the best end. So generally, paying into a pension gives you the most bang for your buck because you're getting tax relief from the government uh, to pay in. 
Don't get confused by that term. Tax relief simply means that the government gives you some of your tax back for paying in, uh, either directly into your pension, if you're a basic rate taxpayer, uh, and into your pension, but also into your bank account if you're a higher rate or an additional rate payer. The downside of that lovely tax relief, of course, is that the money you take out of a pension down the line is taxed, or at least partially. ISAs, on the other hand, give you no special tax breaks for putting money in, but uh, there's never any tax on the way out either, so that's quite important. And there's no age restriction, crucially. Many fans of the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. They talk about using their ISAs to bridge the gap between stopping work and being of pension age. If you want to retire at age 50 and you can't get at your pension until age 58, you're going to need to find somewhere else to get the money from for those eight years. So you can see how blending the two kinds of accounts really provides us with all the flexibility uh, that most of us will ever need. And when you think that the ISA contribution limit is 20000 per year and the pension contribution limit is 40000 per year or 100% of your salary, whichever is lower, someone who was earning, say, eighty grand a year could potentially contribute 60000 quid to their ISA and pension combination each year. They need to keep their bills pretty low. Um, only a fraction of people listening to this are going to be in a position to save more than sixty grand a year, 5000 quid a month between those two accounts, right? Tax and access and decent investment limits. That is why ISA and pension really are all the accounts that most of us will ever need. Okay, hope that makes sense. Third thing we need to know is that higher earners have fewer options. Now, something to be aware of if you're a higher earner, there is a chance that you might not have that level of contribution open to you, right? So if you're earning over £240,000 per year, your pension annual allowance is tapered down progressively. So it gets down to a minimum of £4,000 if your income goes up over £312,000 a year. There is actually a more complex calculation to do to work that out as it all gets skewed by things like salary sacrifice and stuff. We don't need to worry um, about that calculation here. Now, I also don't imagine that there are very many people crying over for, uh, folks who are earning over 300 grand not having much pension allowance left, right? But it is a real issue and is an example when higher levels of wealth often create their own problems. So high earners often consider the charms of venture capital trusts, VCTs, and enterprise investment schemes, EISs, worthy of attention. Both these schemes offer decent levels of tax relief, 30% currently, decent contribution limits. You can put 200 grand in a VCT, a million for an EIS, 2 million actually for one particular kind of EIS. So those are <laughs> you know, pretty decent contribution limits. Uh, 200 grand in a VCT, you get 60,000 quid of your income tax back. That's a pretty useful benefit. And there are capital gains tax and potentially inheritance tax benefits of an EIS. But there is, of course, this thing in the tail. The tax breaks are so good because the government is incentivizing investment into small, early-stage companies. By definition, that means that these are going to be risky investments with a high chance of at least partial failure. Now, generally, your money would be spread only over a very few companies. If one or two of those fail completely, then it could get messy for you. Of course, those companies might also boom and make you 20 times your money back, but it's a risk. Now, you might think that a high earner is more willing to take high risks on their investments, but that's just not my experience. Risk tolerance is a very personal thing, nothing to do really with how much you make or how much you have. EISs and VCTs are likely only going to be the preserve of very few people, but I will come back to them briefly later because they might be useful even more you know, for mere mortals in, in certain circumstances. And then finally, just let's talk quickly about platforms. Uh, these are always a source of confusion, really. I sometimes get emails from people telling me something like, you know, my Hargreaves Lansdowne ISA isn't performing very well. Now, I know what they mean, but actually that statement makes no sense. Hargreaves Lansdowne and Interactive Investor, you Invest, Charles Stanley, and a ton of others, they are platforms. And a platform is merely an admin system which allows you to hold different types of accounts, tax wrappers, in one place. So you can hold an ISA, a pension, and a general investment account all on one platform. Super easy. You log in and you see all three accounts. Now within those accounts or wrappers, you can hold underlying investments. Those might be your funds or whatever. And whichever platform you use then, you know, whichever one is the one for you, is largely down to just a few things. Firstly, taste, which user interface do you like better? 
do you find one confusing uh, and another one perhaps intuitive to use? Well, just use the intuitive one. Charges is another factor. Some platforms charge dealing fees, some don't. Some charge a percentage-based fee, others a flat fee. Which one is best for you depends on your circumstances and what you plan to hold on there. So if you've got a small amount invested, you might be better off with a percentage charging platform until you get to a higher amount invested. And then available investment options. Some platforms are pretty much open architecture. You can buy any traded asset on there. Others are much more limited, perhaps only offering access to funds, not shares or ETFs or whatever. And others are more limited still, uh, perhaps only offering funds from one provider. The Vanguard Investor Platform is an example of that. So let's not lose sight of the fact that really the biggest factor in your future financial success is going to be your choice of underlying assets, not your platform. That and the way they, that you behave towards your money, those are the biggest sort of success factors here. Platforms are just a tool. They're just an admin system. They won't make or break you either way, depending on which one you choose. Okay, so we've gone a little bit deeper into why pensions and ISAs really are where it's at for most people. We've looked at some alternatives for higher earners, and we, I think, starting to understand really what a platform is. So let's just add some further practical steps as we try and put all this together and look at everything you need to do. First thing you need to do is to put your pension to work. So depending on how old you are or how close you consider yourself to being able to retire, perhaps that's a better way of putting it, your pension is going to be your primary growth engine to maximize your future wealth. Now, note, I'm excluding property investment from the equation there. You know that I like property as an asset class. It's just not really a part of our discussions here today, talking about pensions, ISAs, platforms, and stuff. So because your pension is likely to be a long-term play, depending on how old you are, you really should work it as hard as you possibly can. I'm going to talk about defined benefit pensions in a sec, so hold on for that. But let's focus just on DC schemes for now. We're, we're trying to build up a fund. Because your pension is likely to be running for a long time, it has the longest time to compound. It also has the clear benefit of tax relief, meaning that you're really you're getting the most bang for every book or book. <laughs> That's a very northern way of putting it. Most bang for your book or your pound, rather, that you've put in. Now, if you're employed and your boss is paying in for you, that's even better because you're getting their money too. And in practice, this means three things. Firstly, you should push the investments inside your pension as hard as you can. You should maximize your contributions to it, and you should keep costs as low as possible. So let's take those one at a time. Risk, as I've said before, is a function of time. It's a woefully simplistic way of putting it, but it'll serve. And we're going to talk a bit more about risk next week. But for now, let's just agree that the longer you hold an investment, the more its average annual return reverts to the mean. And in practice, what that means is that you should probably take more risk. For which you, uh, we read that you should have a higher equity content in your portfolio inside your pension than you might do for other pots you have. You know, that's a really nasty, horrible set of compound sentences. I've just pulled out my headphones, so I'll just plug those back in, and we'll just forget it never happened. Let me reword that, because that was very waffly. So to put it more simply, if it's going to be ages before you access the money, you should take more risk with it. Because of the benefits of tax relief, possibly employer money going in, there's often more money going into a pension pot than you have personally put in. And that means there's more to compound and grow for the future. We get a kind of accelerant right at the start in the form of our boss's money and tax relief. So we should maximize that. Costs, of course, are compounded too. So you need to keep costs low to minimize that effect. So look for the right charging structure on your platform based on your underlying investments and make sure you keep the costs of those investments themselves down too, using low cost funds and ETFs and things like that. Don't attract unnecessary dealing fees by keeping tweaking to a minimum. Um, you know, tax is really not an issue because there is uh, no tax as the money grows inside a pension. So you don't need to, to worry about rebalancing your portfolio very often. You know, you can do that once a year. That's all I do. Uh, you don't have to worry about capital gains tax or anything like that inside a pension. So you don't have to uh, manage that. Just rebalance once a year. It'll have no tax implications for you. Pensions, I think, are easily left. Uh, you know, left where they are, especially when we move from one job to another. But don't do that. Stay on top of things by keeping them together. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the number of people I, I see with pension pots from six previous jobs still in the default funds, it's not good. Don't put that off. 
get all the details of your existing pensions together and see if you're better off tidying them up. I did do a whole session on that a couple of years ago. I'll link to that in the show notes. Now, if you're in a workplace pension, that should be the main home for your long-term savings. Uh, but you can have a personal pension or a SIP on the site, which becomes a kind of repository for all your old pension plans. Again, check back that old episode because it can sometimes make sense to leave an old pension in place if it's got useful benefits. But generally, your workplace pension is where it's at. You should work it hard, choose investments accordingly, keep your costs down, and don't leave old pensions to linger, right? Tidy them up, sort them out, be intentional about them. Whew, there's a lot in there as well. Second thing you need to do is to understand your DB benefits. Now, you really need to get your head around this. Uh, any sort of defined benefit pensions that you've got so that you can translate uh, the information into what actually those schemes really mean for your future. Now, DB schemes usually work in one of two ways. Either there is an accrual rate, which is usually expressed as a fraction, like 1 60th. If that's you and you're in a 1 60th scheme, then your eventual pension one day will be 1 60th of your salary for every year that you have been a member of the scheme. So if you're in the scheme for 30 years, you'll get 30 60ths or one half of your salary as a pension. Of course, the big question is, half of my salary, how is salary defined? Well, we used to call these schemes final salary schemes because very often that definition of what your salary was when working out your pension was your actual salary in the last year of the scheme, your final salary. Some are based maybe on your average salary for the last three years or your average salary for the highest five years of income in the last 10 years of the scheme. Every scheme varies a little bit. Now, many DB schemes are moving towards what's called a career average revalued earnings or CARE basis. These are much simpler to understand. You'll be glad to know. So in each year, a percentage of your salary will be kind of banked as a future income. So let's just say each year the, uh, the rate is 1.5% and you're earning 50 grand a year. Well, that means in that one year that you earn 50,000, you will bank 750 pounds per year of pension in the future for that year that you worked. Now, if you're 25 years old and you've banked that 750 quid, well, it's gonna be 40 odd years until you can get it. So that 750 pound a year pension will need to be indexed or <laughs> revalued each year to try and keep pace with inflation. Now, often as schemes switch to a care basis, they also put back the retirement age. And so that's why, you know, I see people working for the NHS. They've got two parts to their scheme, the 1995 scheme, where maybe they can retire at age 60, the 2015 scheme, which is the state pension age. And sometimes there's other bits to it as well. So it is important to get your head around all this. And really the simplest way is to look at your annual statement. They're pretty good these days. They're worded much better than they ever used to be. And it will give you a sense of what your pension is worth to this point. Usually it's expressed in today's money. That's the only kind of money we should work in. It's the only kind of money we understand. What will that money buy for us now? So you can really work out how valuable your pension is. Essentially what your statement is saying is, if you retired now, this is what you get. Right, read it carefully. Sometimes they have sections that say if you keep working to pension age, you could expect. I don't really like that. That's sort of you know pie in the sky. Who knows what you're going to be doing next year, let alone in 20 years' time. But of course, the challenge is working out what your future pension might be if you stay in the scheme. And so that means you're going to need to know the basis of the scheme and its workings. But there's tons of variables. You don't know. You might get a promotion. Your salary might go up. You might decide to go four days a week or three days a week. Your salary might go down tons of variables. But if you really want to know this, and you should, take the time to call the pensions department at your company. It depends on the size of the company. There may be somebody in an office somewhere you can sit down with and they'll explain it to you. But definitely try to get on top of your DB scheme benefits. It's important so that you can plan for your future. Third thing we need to do is to be wary of DB transfers, defined benefit pension transfers. It's a hot topic since the pension freedoms of 2015. Now, it has always been possible for you to approach the trustees of a DB scheme and ask them to provide you with a cash equivalent transfer value. That is, how much money they will give you to essentially buy you out of the scheme. So they no longer have to provide your pension benefits one day. You know, they wave goodbye to you, but they give you some money for leaving. That's what a CETB is, cash equivalent transfer value. 
So that can be transferred into a personal pension instead. And over the last few years, for many people, those transfer values have been large. I mean, akin to winning the lottery for many people. So before, maybe they had a vague idea of a future income that they'd receive one day. And now they've got a sheet of paper saying, we will pay you £900,000 to get out of this pension. Right? Very tempting, understandably, for many people. But the problems with this are just manifest. Any idiot could see that there would be problems with this, really. Firstly, for a lot of people, this was the first time they'd ever had access to that kind of money, even if it was in a pension scheme. And they just weren't prepared to handle it. And very often, they didn't fully understand what they were giving up either. You know, a guaranteed rising income for life with a spouse's pension if you die first is an incredibly valuable benefit. Those benefits were guaranteed by the scheme, the company, the sponsoring provider. If the scheme itself failed, there were further guarantees very often in the pension protection fund. But if you take your pot out of your DB scheme, suddenly the responsibility for making sure that the pension fund sustained, uh, sustained you for the rest of your life, that's in your hands now, and it's in the hands of ordinary people. And without question, the advice industry and the regulator has just singularly let down many of these perfectly good people. High-profile mis-selling to members of the British Steel Pension Scheme. It's just a stain on my profession, and it's shocking, really, that it can still happen. Uh, you know, it's not like 1975 or anymore or anything like that. That it can still happen this late on is uh, a real uh, indictment on the regulator and on unscrupulous advisors. So we saw hard-working steel workers who'd worked for 30-odd years in incredibly difficult conditions just see their pension funds disappear into dodgy, high-commission offshore investments with no recourse. The government created a market, really, with the pensions freedoms, and then the government's own regulator was too slow to stop the bad practice, which was just robbing many thousands of people of their life savings. And now in a textbook case of shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted, the regulator has really started to crack down. That means that PI insurance for advisors has really tightened. And so now it's really hard to find a decent advisor who is willing to take on DB transfer advice. And if you do, it's going to cost you thousands of pounds in fees. So it is still possible to transfer out your DB scheme. But the regulators and my view is that for the vast majority of people, DB pension benefits are best left in place. So tread very carefully in the area of DB transfers, okay? Okay, number four that we need to do is to use your ISA for breadth. Now, if your, push, your pension rather is for pushing hard for the future, then your ISA is where you can get a bit of nuance if that's what you want to do. So remember the possible need for access and consider investing some of your ISA money with a view to enabling that access. So as an advisor, I'll often make sure that some of my client's money within an ISA is held in a guilt fund, for example. So that can act as a volatility modifier in the portfolio as a whole. But if the equity portion of the portfolio is down and then some money is needed expectedly, uh, unexpectedly, it's also a useful place to take that from, from the guilt aspect, because it's a lot less volatile. I suggest that you use your ISA to experiment with to the extent that you want to. So maybe you're familiar with the concept of a core and a satellite portfolio, something I talk about a lot here. So the bulk of your money is in a core portfolio. Pretty boring. Um, well, maybe not boring, but it's basically that is doing the work for you for the long term. And then you've got satellites around the side where you can maybe try new things, tilt your money towards a sector that you're interested in perhaps. The idea is that the core should do most of the work of getting you to your goals so that if the satellites are on the side go belly up, well, you haven't bet the whole farm on it. And sometimes, of course, those satellites can really boost things along. I just think this is ideal territory for your ISA, uh, especially when building wealth in the accumulation phase. Have some fun in your ISA. Use it to broaden your approach to try new things if you want to. Many of my clients, many people listen to this, are quite happy for the core to be it, basically. They don't need or want anything fancy around the side. But if you do want to, then your ISA is a good place for that. Number five of eight today. We've got five today. So don't forget the humble GIA, right? So if you come into a lump sum, perhaps, or if you're in a position to be able to invest more than the, the annual ISA and pension allowances, 
Don't forget that a GIA, a general investment account, is a decent option as a kind of staging area. I've often have to explain uh, to clients that even though they can only put 20,000 each into an ISA each year, that doesn't mean that that's all they can invest, right? <laughs> so if you've got, say, 200,000 pounds to invest as a couple, you could put 20,000 each into your ISAs. That leaves 160,000 left. Well, rather than just leave that in the bank doing nothing, you know, waiting patiently for next year's ISA allowance to roll around, it should still be invested just inside a GIA. So at least the money is working while it's waiting to be added to your tax-efficient accounts. Yeah, you might pay some income tax if there's enough in your GIA to produce more dividends than your annual dividend allowance. You might pay capital gains tax if you just leave it there and don't manage it over time. Every year you can do what's called a bed and ISA transaction, which essentially shifts money out of your GIA into your ISA. You do have to sell the assets in the GIA down to cash and contribute cash into the ISA. You can't usually just shift the funds or shares or whatever straight into your ISA directly. Given the amounts involved, there are very unlikely to be capital gains tax issues in doing so, uh, unless you've made gains elsewhere in your financial life. If you have, then tread carefully. You should progressively try to shift as much money as possible into tax-efficient accounts. It's really obvious that, so don't neglect it. Number six, use VCTs if you want to push really hard. So if you're making the best use of your pension in your ISIS, you might consider venture capital trusts or VCTs on top of that. So I mentioned the income tax benefits of VCTs earlier and also warned you about the risks involved with those kind of investments. But if you want to push your portfolio really hard and you understand, uh, you understand rather and are prepared to accept those risks, then definitely look into VCTs as an option. There's no capital gains tax when you sell VCT shares. That's another benefit. You are locked in for five years if you want to keep the income tax benefits. But, you know, VCTs are useful for high earners who've got more limited pension saving options, but they also have a place really for anyone with a high risk appetite that wants to build wealth. Um, interestingly, you can even roll over a maturing VCT into another one and get tax relief on the same money for a second time. Not bad. As always, do your homework and seek advice in this area. Read any literature from cover to cover. Make sure you know and are happy with the way your money will be invested. Don't risk money on VCTs that you can't afford to lose. Number seven, use EISs for CGT management. So enterprise investment schemes, very tax efficient, often come into play when people are looking to do something about a capital gains tax problem. EISs allow you to defer paying your capital gains tax by investing the gain you have made elsewhere into one of those schemes. You can then unwind the EIS progressively over time within your annual CGT allowance. So rather than all at once, as is the case if you sell an investment property or if you sold your business, you've got a big gain, happens all at once, big tax bill. Filter that through an EIS, you can unwind it over time and maybe even potentially pay no capital gains tax at all. Again, make sure you know what you're getting into. <laughs> uh, you, or make sure you know what the downside risk is. If ever there was an object lesson in not letting the tax tail wag the investment dog, this is it. All right? If you didn't have a tax problem, would you still look at an EIS? If the answer is no, <laughs> then you might want to think twice about considering them even now. EISs, VCTs, they are risky. You might lose a lot of money. Is a definite tax saving worth a possible 100% loss of your money? Your call, right? But this is specialist stuff, not the sort of thing that you can reliably ask about in some online forum somewhere. Seek advice. And make sure your advisor knows what he or she is talking about. And then finally, keep things tidy and under review. I bet some of you would have guessed that's what I was going to say last. So try to keep things optimized by reviewing things regularly. Review your platforms, your accounts, underlying investments. Anything which is left to its own devices will eventually drift out of kilter. You have to steer the ship. You can't just allow the tides to take you wherever they will. So set aside a regular date once a year to take stock of things. I've done sessions on how to review uh, in the past. I'll link to those in the show notes. The only one who's completely invested in your financial future is you, right? No one's going to do it for you unless they're forced to because your rich great uncle named them as trustees or something. But assuming you're not a trust fund baby, you're going to need to be intentional about staying on top of these things. So check your charges. Are they proportionate? Could you save money by switching to a different platform? Check your level of savings. Can you increase it? Remember the power of small increments that we talked about last week. Log into your platform now. Push the monthly savings up a bit. Go on, I dare you. 
Are you going to use all your allowances this year? If so, what should you do with any excess? If not, can you find more money to max your ISA or pension? Check the split of your savings between pensions and ISAs. Is it optimal for your time of life? Are you getting to the point where you should shift the focus more towards pensions? Check the underlying assets, the funds, the shares, the ETFs that you hold. Do you need to rebalance the component parts to bring them back into the proportion that they need to be in? Have any of the funds done badly? Do you know why? Is there anything that needs to be done? Get all your statements together. Make sure all is as it should be. Address any actions that you need to take and get them done. And then you can forget about it until next year or until some life event causes an ad hoc review of things. Or you could just pay an advisor to do it all for you. Just saying. Okay, I think the last three weeks we've covered a lot of ground, actually. I wanted to sort of do the ultimate guide season so that I had a place to send people. <laughs> you know, Have you got anything on investing? Well, I have, actually. I've got an ultimate guide. But I do have a place where you can go deeper still. And to sort of celebrate this season of ultimate guides, I'm doing a special offer on Meaningful Academy. That's where uh, you get my best thinking on this stuff. So these uh, ultimate guides to investing last couple of weeks, this week and next week, they lend themselves to the build wealth phase of the academy, which is for folks looking to understand investments, looking to pursue financial independence. I show you how to use free tools like Morningstar to choose the right funds for you. There's guides there, calculators, video lessons, all about choosing investments, financial planning, behavioral finance. Plus, there's a year's access to the best financial planning software in the world called Voyant Go. Really, there is everything you need in there to get your finances off on the right footing. And there's a private Facebook group as well, so you can ask questions in a safe place from people in a similar position to you. So if you want to take radical action and do so quickly, Meaningful Academy is the best place to learn how to do that. So there's a special link, meaningfulacademy.com slash special BW. That special price will expire at midnight on the 4th of December. Okay, so just be aware of that. Meaningful money, no, meaningfulacademy.com slash special BW for build wealth. Okay. Okay, we've got a review here from Rob Lowe 66 who says first and best. Meaningful Money was the first financial podcast I listened to, and it remains the best. Pete is helpful, informative, and reassuring. This podcast was the one that gave me the kickstart to get my finances in order. With just under six years to retirement, I'm grateful that it did. Great stuff. Many thanks. Nice one, Rob Lowe. Six years to retirement and counting. Well done for taking action. I'm really glad the show has been useful for you. If you're listening to this or watching it on YouTube, you know, leave me a rating or review. Go to MeaningfulMoney.tv slash love, just like Rob Lowe 66 did. Um, obviously, that helps other people to hear about the show and subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button under this video and click subscribe and the little bell so that you get a notification whenever a new episode comes out. Okay, closing in on 10,000 subs on YouTube. So help me out. Let's get there. Okay, next week, I'm going to be attempting the ultimate guide to risk. Yeah, another huge topic. So I better get writing. Huh? Um, and really, that's it for this season of the Meaningful Money Podcast. Hope it was helpful. Thank you so much. Any comments or questions and to download the workbook and all the links and stuff, meaningfulmoney.tv slash UG6 for ultimate guide number six. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash UG6. Hope you enjoyed it, folks. Thank you so much for listening. Whew, I'll talk to you next week. Cheers. Oh, 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 oh,